Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rechtenwald. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. This is Luke Shortridge. I am hanging out with Andy Rechtenwald. Andy, how are you doing today? Great as always, Luke. How about yourself? I am doing well, and I am totally excited about today's show. We are talking about Nehemiah, which happens to be my favorite book of the Old Testament. Woo-hoo. This book, man, it just it, it gets me right in the heart. <laughs> I, I'm so excited. I can't wait till we get to start talking about it. I did, though, want to hit, before we get into the meat of today's discussion, Yeah. The idea of leadership, because yeah. that's what we're going to be talking about today. And, and I'm kind of curious, Andy, what do you think is it that really, truly makes a great leader? Okay, so um, I think the number one quality for a good leader is humility. I think no matter what, you have to be a leader with um, humility because um, it, character, which I think the best part of character is when you can be a humble person, determines how effective you can be as a leader because you need people's trust to be a leader. So I think humility is the most important aspect of leadership. I remember, I think it was Patrick Lencioni that said at some point in this last year, I don't remember if it was a, maybe it was Leadership Summit. Possibly. He he said, I'm sick of hearing about servant leadership because I'm not sure there's any other type. Ah. There you go. There you go. So I put together a little list, the seven leadership lessons I have learned since January, since becoming a campus pastor. I posted this on my blog a few months back. Maybe you checked that out. Did you you read my blog? (laughs) I did. How many many people actually read that blog? Okay, well, since you ask, I think it was about 113. 113? Yeah. Okay, so if I may. That was views. If I may. uh, How many of those views were your mom? Okay, my mom does read my blog. A, a few. Well, I don't know. I don't know if there's any way to know that. You know, I'm just messing, You know man. what my dad does? What? He prints off my blog posts and takes them to work and makes people read them. <laughs> yes, my parents think I'm cool. Are you listening, Mom? Are you listening to what his parents do, Mom? Well, the 111 other people that read it really enjoyed it, so I thought I would bring it to you. Uh, these are the top seven things that I have learned since being a campus pastor. I'm just going to jump right in yeah, because if it. I don't, you're going to keep making fun of me. Yeah. So the first lesson that I have learned is that everybody has a boss. Yeah. No matter who you are, you have to answer to someone. And except for maybe Hansel from the movie Zoolander, who is so hot right now, <laughs> everybody has to answer to somebody. <laughs> oh, our producer is groaning. That's bad. <laughs> Second thing is that the higher up you go in an organization, the less personal freedom you have. You probably think it's the opposite, but the truth is the guy at the bottom, you know, the guy who's working the fry later at McDonald's, he can screw off and he can not show up for work. You know, he can do a a double order and munch on some himself. Probably isn't going to get caught. Nobody's going to care that much. The higher up that you go, the more that you are responsible for other things and you're held to a higher standard as well. Number three, it can be lonely at the top. As I say that, not that I you know, sit around feeling lonely all the time now that I'm a campus pastor, but it, it is tough when you have to make difficult decisions yeah. and live with those decisions and wrestle with those decisions. So I would just say encourage your leaders whenever you possibly can. Number four is that it takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. Your personal devotion to the Lord is more important as you continue on and progress in your leadership. You need to have strong personal disciplines as you lead others. If you can't lead yourself, how could you possibly lead others? Number five, give authority to others carefully and selectively because nothing says, I don't trust you, like taking back authority once it's been given. Number six, a good leader must be a good follower. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but sometimes really being a good leader is as simple as keeping your mouth shut, doing what you're told, following directions well, and supporting other people in the organization. Not very sexy, shall we say, but right. sometimes that's what it takes to be a good leader. Last thing, and you touched on this already, Andy, great job, is that a good leader is a servant. That if you are not serving others, if you think that your position somehow entitles them to serve you, you really don't understand what leadership is 
at all. Yeah, so the reason why we talk about leadership is because Nehemiah is a story about good leadership. And so let's get into the context of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, you want to talk about the purpose of the book? Yeah, I'd love to. So Nehemiah is the last of the historical books of the Old Testament, which is kind of what we've been teaching through. It records the history of the third return to Jerusalem following the captivity. If you want to find out more about the first and second trips back to Jerusalem, check out our podcast on Ezra. But Nehemiah is the third trip back. There's still work to be done, and specifically work about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Yeah, and so then the author is Nehemiah. Uh, much of it, it's really cool, is written in first person. It's almost like a journal entry. So, uh, And we pro- Ezra probably edited it as well since he was a scribe. I have to agree. The original audience were the exiles who returned from captivity, and then the generations after that as well. Date of writing, probably about 445 to 432 B.C. Uh, This this book happens directly after Ezra's story. Yeah, so what was going on around that time that it was written? What was going on? uh, We have Zerubbabel, who led the first group. Is that pronounced that right? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Great name to say. Thank you. Yeah, he led the first group to Jerusalem to rebuild. Then you had Ezra, which we talked about in our last podcast, led the second um, in 458 B.C., and then... Just a few short years later, in 445 B.C., Nehemiah returned with a third group to rebuild the city walls. So Nehemiah is probably the key character of the book. The book has his name. He is a person of character, persistence, and he truly is a man of prayer. Every time opposition comes, the first thing that he does, not the last thing, the first thing he does is go to God in prayer. He's a brilliant planner. He's an organizer, a motivator. Really somebody I think that all of us should study and hope to uh, assume some of the characteristics he had in our own life. Yeah, and then you have Ezra, um, which we talked about in our last podcast, but there's still some, uh, he's still involved in the book of Nehemiah. These guys knew each other. Yeah, they were friends, cool. you know. Uh, Ezra was a scribe and a careful man of God's word. We talked about this last podcast, but Ezra really, really um, was devoted to the word of God. He had a passion for renewing the religious festivals and following the law, and he also helped Nehemiah. So God uses both of these guys, but they were very different men. I mean, if you look at them and you study them, they went about doing God's work in different ways, and really they were both passionate about slightly different things when it came to the kingdom of God. So uh, who were some of the people, Andy, that opposed Nehemiah in his work? Yeah, one, I love this name. I don't know if I pronounce it right, but it's the way I pronounce it. Sanballat, he's the governor of Samaria, which is a region north of Judea, and he was definitely in opposition to Nehemiah. And then you also had Tobiah. He was the governor of the Transjordan region, also under the Persians, and he opposed Nehemiah as well. There were no shortages of enemies for Nehemiah and the work that he felt God had called him to do. Yeah, um, so then let's go through some of the the big themes of this book. The first is prayer, and Luke, you already mentioned it, um, but Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He prayed whenever the chance he got, he prayed. Uh, Both Nehemiah and Ezra responded to problems in the same way. They they prayed immediately, and then they acted. Andy, do you feel that you pray immediately when you (sighs) have opposition in your life? It's hard to not just act or take take action instead of just praying. It's something I'm working on, but I, I will admit right now... If something doesn't go my way, going immediately to prayer is not usually my no. my first modus operandi. So vision is another huge theme, seeing not what is but what could be. Nehemiah really had a vision from God of rebuilding the walls, and the walls represented power, protection. It also represented the prestige of the city of Jerusalem, what it used to be. So Nehemiah is given this vision from God, and he kind of has this holy discontent, which we're going to talk about in a second. And because of that vision and being able to communicate it to others, he is able to accomplish something that is almost unimaginable at the time. Yeah, and then finally, uh, we've already kind of touched on it, but leadership, that's a huge theme in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, He demonstrates excellent leadership. He had a huge task ahead of him that took like careful planning, motivation. Uh, he had to, and then also deal with a lot of the conflict that happened with all the opposition. So, right. so it's there's, leadership. There, there's opposition externally, but then there's also opposition internally. Right. It, it's a troubled time for Nehemiah. Yeah, He's got the cards stacked against him. He shows that uh, being a leader isn't about a title or getting all the recognition, but instead it's about hard work, not giving up and continuing with the mission that you believe that you have. If you care about leadership 
at all, you've got to check out the book of Nehemiah. It's a great I mean, book. it's it's kind of sandwiched in the middle there after the history books and before you get into Psalms and Proverbs, but it is well worth your time to check out the book if you haven't done so in a while. Yeah, so here uh, um, we'll outline the key events real quick and then we'll get into reading. So from chapter one through the end of chapter seven, uh, we see that Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem and leads the people. Then after that, we see uh, religious reforms happening from the end of 7 to the uh, end of the book. Ezra and Nehemiah read the law to the people and bring about national repentance. Very cool. So every week we want to give you guys an opportunity to get into God's Word with us. We wish we could cover everything, but we just can't. If you if you seriously get a chance, go through, check out Nehemiah on your own, and journal about your experiences from that. We're going to be reading from the New Living Translation version today. So if you want to follow along with us, we would love for you to do that. You can pull out your Bible, or you, if you are listening on your phone, you can switch over to a Bible app, and we'll kind of give you guys the chapter and the verse we're reading from so that you can follow along. If you're doing this, if you're listening to this podcast on your own, Journal the questions that we have for you. You can stop the podcast for a second and journal them. And if you're listening with a group of friends, I know that some of the life groups are checking out our podcast, which is awesome. Stop the podcast after the questions and take a few minutes to discuss. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 4. It reads this. They said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Oh, I I love this. So... Nehemiah gets this report that things are not going well in his hometown of Jerusalem. At the time, he's living as a captive. He's a slave, essentially. And he maybe has never even been to his homeland, to Jerusalem. But he's heard about it, heard stories about it. The Israelites have been in captivity now for 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Israel is in shambles. And Nehemiah hears this report that the walls of the city are torn down. And what does he do? He breaks down almost like has a breakdown he starts crying he starts weeping and all of a sudden he's given this vision of rebuilding the walls well doesn't sound very spiritual rebuilding walls no it sure doesn't and i think it's a great picture of what ministry is probably really like you know in seminary they don't teach you how to set up classrooms they don't teach you how to clean bathrooms they don't teach you about scheduling software but when you become a pastor all of these non-spiritual tasks very important are really important Andy, yeah. you were one time a long time ago <laughs> like two years ago my intern three years ago four. Oh my gosh time yeah, flies seriously and as an intern in the church i i felt it was my duty to prepare you for ministry as best i could and yeah. that meant scrubbing the stairwell yep learning how to properly wipe down and wash a commode that's what we call it in the industry it's a commode. toilet top okay. to bottom all right that Good, you remember? Somebody was taking notes. I still clean bathrooms. And then also, another very important ministry task, waxing the twirly slide. Yeah, um, that was not fun. That was the least favorite part. I hit my head on the end of the slide. Well. It's not made for adults, even short ones. Ministry is painful at times, Andy. It is very painful. That's kind of how it goes. (laughs) Uh, You know, all joking aside, there are times in ministry where you have to do non-spiritual things because it's a matter of serving people. We talked about servant leadership. And when people show up for a class, they don't know that maybe you just spent the last hour setting up that classroom. But if you don't set it up, then you can't. Right, and if a bathroom's disgusting, I mean, that doesn't really help new people that are coming to the church. So these things are important. Why, though, is why were the walls so important? The walls represented protection. They represented the ability to fend off attacks. It also, the temple had been destroyed and ransacked so many times. The temple is rebuilt but there's no walls to protect the temple. The temple is, um, at any point, it, it's, it's open vulnerable. for attack. It's yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. Exactly. In Proverbs, it says that a person without self-control is like a city whose walls have been broken down. Yeah. That there was no control in the city. It started to be rebuilt a little bit, but without the walls being there, it was vulnerable to attack for anybody else. And, and Nehemiah, he just couldn't take it. He had enough of that. And that's what we talked about earlier, holy, holy discontent. He just couldn't does, stand it anymore. Where does that phrase come from? Do you remember? I don't remember. It comes from Bill Hybels. He oh, yeah. put a book Bill out, Hybels. Holy Discontent. It's a good know. one. And he talked about Popeye. I think we have a clip. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. 
So there are certain times in your life where you've just had enough. Enough is enough. I can't take it anymore. And perhaps this is something, the word holy, meaning it's from God. Yeah. You are angry. You're upset. You're overwhelmed. you got to act. you got to do something. That's where Nehemiah finds himself at. He just he can't take it anymore. The Israelites have been through so much. He's got to do something. So a question that we have for you guys is, have you ever experienced holy discontent, and what does your heart currently break for? Luke, you want to talk about this? I guess there's a few different areas in my life where I feel that God has supernaturally made me aware of uh, certain suffering or problems. And one of those areas that my heart breaks for is men, men being men, men being fathers, men being husbands, being who God called them to be. I really have a heart for struggling marriages. Um, My words, I guess, on the subject to anybody who will listen who is in a difficult marriage, a marriage they think is beyond repair, is don't give up. Don't stop fighting for your family. Your marriage is worth fighting for. God can redeem your relationship. You got to give him your heart. You got to give him everything. You may have to work harder than you ever imagined possible, but nothing is beyond God's ability to redeem. No relationship has gone too far. Sweet. Yeah. So if you're interested in finding out more about this, you can certainly check out our last podcast on Ezra, where we talked about that a little bit. Yeah, we touched on it a little bit at the end. Um, so let's move on then. We're going to be in the uh, same chapter, chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, uh, which, Luke, you want to go ahead and read that for us? Yeah. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. So that finishes his prayer. And then the next sentence is, In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. I love this line. Yeah, it, This is an ominous, what am I going to do line. I'm a nobody. I'm a cupbearer. He's, he's expendable. He's expendable. Yep. He's the guy that is supposed to drink the poison so that he dies <laughs> instead the of the king dies. Yep. So... Every time the king eats food, drinks wine, give it to that nobody first, let him drink it. And then if he doesn't die, okay, then the king can have some after that. What's interesting, though, is even though Nehemiah was a nobody, he had unique access. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, when when you read the actual narrative, you see that when the king asks him what's going on, it's because he sees Nehemiah's face. And so obviously, even though Nehemiah was a nobody, he had direct access to the king. And the king got to know him, apparently, because he was concerned about why he was so upset. Right. You know, so that's that's huge. And, and not only that, you get to see through this process, we talked about earlier, one of the themes of prayer, like, he's a man of prayer. And that's awesome. We often find ourselves in a position that's similar to Nehemiah's, where we feel under-resourced. Um, we don't have any influence, or maybe we have an impossible task, sort of right. like a cupbearer. Uh, but we have access to a king. Uh, King Jesus, who has all the power we could ever need and more. Very good. And that brings us to our discussion question here, or our question for thought and reflection. How can God use your current position to accomplish something great for the kingdom of God? Yeah, for me, uh, I love my job because I have the opportunity to play a part in uh, a student's, the way that they view the world, their worldview. Um, And all the studies show that a lot of the things that you decide or that you believe in or that you, um, I guess, promote and like maybe your political beliefs, the taste in music, uh, your beliefs about God, that stuff is formed when you are in middle school and in high school. It's amazing. So I can look back and think my taste in music, we talked about that in the last podcast, was formed through middle school and high school and growing up, that kind of stuff. Political beliefs, religious beliefs, all of that. And so... I, I love that I get to play a part in influencing the next generation because I know that if they, even if they don't believe in God leaving, um, leaving vertical, because there's a lot of kids that come that don't know who God is, if at least that they know that there's a reason to believe in God or that it's not just foolishness to be a Christian, um, I've played a part in, a small part in, uh, in their worldview in their life. Very cool. So Nehemiah puts together a master plan. He decides to look sad. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yep. He looks sad, and as you said earlier, the king knew him apparently well enough that this was something out of the norm. So, yep. you know, he brought his A game every day, had a good attitude. The one day that he looked sad, the king asked him, Nehemiah, what's wrong? Why and what, do you look so downcast? <laughs> what does he say back? So his response simply <laughs> is, long live the king. So I think that's smart. He yeah. gives the king props to start, Definitely and then he says, him. how can I not be sad when Jerusalem's walls are destroyed and burned by fire? 
And then the king goes on to ask, how can I help? Right. So it gives him the perfect in that he needed to really make this request about his holy discontent. And that is, king, can I go? Can I go? Can I take some more of your slaves with me? And can I go and rebuild the walls of my city? Yeah, and he lets him go. But there was some opposition in that process. We're going to read about that next. Um, and not from the king, but from other people. So in Nehemiah three nineteen through 20, it says this, But when Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab heard our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked? I replied, The God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. What's fascinating to me here is that Nehemiah did not say, I've already got the king's permission. Yeah. Which he, he could have could have said, but he decides instead to just say, God is going to help me succeed. Yeah. And that's enough. That That's all that he has to say. Now, these other men, I don't believe, followed God, so they probably were like, you know, why is your God superior to my God? They didn't really get it and understand yep. it, but Nehemiah did. God was in the works here. He was going to bless Nehemiah's mission uh, because God was behind that holy discontent that Nehemiah felt. Yeah, and these guys did not want to see Jerusalem restored. They wanted no, they to, did not. <laughs> not at all. They wanted to govern their neighboring lands with no opposition. And, and, if, and if Jerusalem at once a world power was restored, um, or Israel was, but Jerusalem being the capital, like this is not good news for them. And so they opposed it very, and, and in a very um, persistent way. I think something we could take from that is that not everybody in our life is going to be happy if you begin living for God. No, they are not. Not at all. And I think most Christians have had experience in this, especially if they converted later in life. Um, that people, brings us to our next discussion yeah, question. So, Andy, why, why don't you go ahead and read it there? Yeah, it says, uh, when have you experienced opposition because you did something big for God? Could have been a project, working on a cause, or a personal reform. All right, Andy, I'm curious. When is a time you experience negativity in your life because of your faith in Christ? Yeah, um, when I first started following Christ when early on in college, I think it was my sophomore year in college, um, none of my friends were Christians, none of them. And so uh, it was a very interesting time for me because my inner circle of friends were not people that believed the same stuff that I did, and so my actions had to start changing. And it wasn't a violent opposition or nothing like you'd read in Nehemiah where I was ridiculed and made fun of. It was a sim- simply they just did not understand some of the decisions that I was making. And did they make fun of you? Did they uh, occasionally? But that stuff? wasn't. Yeah, it was occasional. But we were good enough friends where their their misunderstanding didn't turn to that kind of stuff. But I'm not really that close to them anymore. I, I hardly ever talk to them. And it's not because I don't want to, but because we we grew apart, and that was a very painful process for me. And I always I always kind of counsel uh, young adults and uh, new converts, especially, to talk to them about their friend circle because. Whether you like it or not, if your closest friends aren't believers, you're going to experience, even if it's not um, external, or even if it's not very, uh, I don't know, kind of like obvious persecution, even people questioning your beliefs all the time is a form of persecution. If you're constantly surrounded by people who don't support your decisions, yeah, they're just going to be negative that's about it. Exactly. And that's what it was. It's like, I don't understand why you wouldn't, you know, for case in point, have sex before marriage or, you know, anything right. like that. It was all. Um, not super negative in the way that we see in the book of Nehemiah, but stuff that definitely uh, definitely troubled me for sure. I think when you're sinning in very public ways, you want the people around you to sin as well yep. because then you feel less guilty about it and you make that normal somehow. So if you start living for God, get ready because opposition is going to come your way. For sure. Well, let's jump ahead a couple chapters. Nehemiah 4, 14 through 17 says, Then I looked over the situation. I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand, supporting their load, the other one holding a weapon. This is fascinating to me. So at this point, Nehemiah has prayed. He knows that God is going to bless it. And he still puts provisions in place to militarily protect his people as they're carrying out God's plan. What is that about? Do you think it was a lack of faith? Uh, No, this is really interesting. I think that he knew God had his back, but still took every measure necessary. And here's a a quote that I want want your opinion on. Now, you hear this before and now. 
it's very, I'll just read it. Pray as if it all depends on God, but work as if it all depends on you. I've heard this. I like it personally. I know many Christians hate it yeah. vehemently. Yep. Uh, I, I've heard some Christians say that this is just a little bit more fancied up of the version of God helps those who helps themselves, yeah. which I definitely don't, don't believe agree in. With you. Yeah. Uh, I think that w- when you look at Nehemiah, when you look at how he went about his work, he was a pragmatist. He prayed as if it all depended on God, but then he acted immediately after that. Yeah. And he took precautions, and he planned as if it was going to be all on him. Yeah. Uh, essentially, I think Nehemiah acted out this phrase to the best of his ability. Yeah, and maybe a good rephrasing just to make sure everybody doesn't hate it is maybe something like pray because it all depends on God and work as if it depends on you. Yeah, I like it. Cool. So here's our question then. Why is Christian community so important? Who is one spiritually mature person in your life that you know really has your back? Luke, uh, you got an answer to this one? I do. So, you know, thinking about Nehemiah and the way that his troops really depended on each other and the laborers did, there's been many people in my life that have helped me get to where I'm at. But when I think about the very best moments of my life and the very worst moments of my life, the first phone call I made was to the same guy. And for me, it was a spiritual leader in my life. His name is Ed Bellner. Many of you guys know him as the West Toledo campus pastor. Mm -hmm. And Ed has been there for me. He was actually, and he's going to hate that I tell you this, he was my junior high pastor. (laughs) 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 Sorry, Ed. Uh, But for the past, I'm not going to say how many years, Ed has been that person in my life that I know that I can depend on. He's going to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. He is someone who is... Um, has been and continues to be more mature in his faith than I am, that I continue to have a lot to learn from, and his help in my life has been invaluable. And that's key in, in a spiritual life. You need to have somebody older than you that's been where you're going, that kind of stuff that you can go to to you know, ask advice, confess certain things to, seek counsel, that kind of stuff. I think that's super important in, in your spiritual walk. Um, but let's continue. After 52 days, the wall is completed, which is Amazing. Amazing, yeah. It's incredible Unbelievable. Feat. These slaves who are from another <laughs> tribe have prob- yep. or from another land have probably never been at their hometown. Get there, they have this crazy goal of building the wall. They're opposed every step of the way, yep. and in 52 days, it's done. They complete it. But the work is not done because the people still needed to act like the people of God or else the walls are essentially useless. Yeah, and I think that's really where Ezra comes in. You know, yeah. Nehemiah is a great leader. He's got a great strategy, a plan. But Ezra is the one that says, okay, we've completed these walls, but now we have to act as the people yep. of God. And the way that he does that is by bringing them right back to the scriptures. So Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. So the people realized that they weren't obeying God's law. And they what did they do? Well, there, there were several things that they did wrong to that point. I think they realize it. So as soon as they hear this, they start weeping yeah. openly. They repent almost immediately. And Ezra tells them that in order to be the people of God as they're supposed to be, they need to have a party. Yeah. They need to celebrate. <laughs> a God-mandated religious holiday that the people of Israel had not followed for years and years and years, yep. maybe hundreds of years, um, perhaps since the time of Joshua. They have to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, or as known uh, as you read about it, the Festival of Shelters. Yeah, um, and that's crazy. Like, and this isn't a self-centered like let's party because we're so great, but party because God is so great. Exactly. Type mentality, which is really really cool. So here's a question for you guys: When was the time God's word convicted you or changed your belief on something, and what did you do as a result? Because when I read that passage and I see that they are all reading the in a sense, we could take it today and say we're reading the Bible, and maybe the Bible says something um, that you're doing is wrong. My response typically, because I'm sinful, is not to sit there and weep about how much of a sinner I am, Right. but it's, maybe sometimes to explain it away or ask people, is the Bible really saying that I shouldn't do right, this? You know right. what I'm saying? So for me, is like when I read that, um, I'm like, man, that's not my reaction typically, and it just shows how you know sinful I am. I can remember being a teenager and reading in Ephesians where it talks about only using speech that is helpful for building other people up. Yeah. And I sat back in my chair and I thought, oh my gosh, my language was not good at the time. (laughs) How often have I cut other people down with my words? I have been 
actively opposing God yeah. in how I have handled my language, my talk. It cut me to the core. Uh, not that I got everything cleaned up since then, um, but I remember that there was nothing like God's Word to convict us and show us the sin in our life. Yeah, I think that's what's crazy awesome about the Bible is that when you read it with, um, I guess, as an open canvas where you can be impacted by it, not reading it to to forward your particular behavior, but when you see something that maybe you disagree with or it kind of strikes a chord in you because you feel guilty about something, your first reaction should be repentance and um, um, kind of moving towards God. But a lot of the times... It, we kind of go the other way. Yeah, we go the other way. <laughs> so uh, reading with an open, like uh, using your soul and, and your response as an open canvas to say, God, please use your word to shape me, to mold me, to pull me closer to you. That that has been life-changing in my life. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. It definitely is. Well, there's so much more in the book of Nehemiah. I wish we could do another show just on Nehemiah. Yeah. But we can't. Our producer is giving me the evil eye right now. So <laughs> we're going to have to wrap this thing up. When you read Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, you, you see this theme of the people need to repent. And even after the walls are built, there's still repentance to happen. Yeah. Nehemiah goes back, as he promised that he would, after this time of building is completed. He comes back a, f- you know, a few years later, and what happened? The people are intermarrying again. All of yep. the evil, sinful things that had happened once again takes place. There's still work to be done. I'd say leadership is rough. It definitely is. Even after so many great victories, the people take a few steps backward, and, and God still has to work in yeah. their lives. They're people. They always will, and we still experience that today. You know, you can see it in a, from a pastor's perspective. It seems like sometimes, and even with your own self, but from an external perspective, when you counsel somebody and give them good advice that you think is good, and they just just don't listen to it, you know, oh, it's yeah. just like, oh, man. So, yeah. If you're interested at all in spiritual leadership, either leading yourself or leading others, I highly suggest the book Spiritual Leadership by Henry Blackaby. It is well worth the read. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, Next episode, we're going to be looking at the life of one very brave young woman named Esther. She was tough. She was very tough. And brave. And brave. She's one of the cool chicks of the Bible who, you know, led the way, shamed the men around her. That's right. Female empowerment, baby. Can't wait. Join us next time.